All right, so this week we continue uh, with looking at what does our butts look like. This is our ninth week in this series, which is amazing. But today's butt is but first. But first. Today's butt is about what takes first place in our lives. Today's butt is about what takes first place in our lives. What is it that we really cannot live without? Years ago, when I was, well, I was still speaking in schools, but years ago, one of the things I presented was what was important to kids. And I remember we used to watch uh, Survivor. Uh, I guess it's still on the air. I, we stopped watching a long time ago, but we really liked Survivor. And actually, my kids, um, and I'm not sure what they're, their, their whole reason for this was they were in high school and stuff. They printed me out an application. Uh, they said, Dad, you would be awesome at this. Now, I'm not sure if it was they really thought I'd be awesome with it or two, I would be away for 30 days and three, I may not come back. I, I'm not sure. I think each one of my children had a little bit of a motivation behind that, but they printed my, and I actually started filling out the application. Where I got off the boat was where I had to make a video of myself, you know, like pitching myself. I was like, forget it. But I found, and I shared this with students, uh, it, it says, you're allowed to bring two items with you. What two items would you bring with you? It was right on the application. You only get two items. And they said, what, what, what would... And I really sat and thought for a long time about that. Now, most people would say the first thing you're going to bring is a Bible. No, I'm not bringing a Bible unless I'm going to burn it to make a fire. I, 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 I'm sorry. I know the Bible. I, I repeat scriptures in my head. I'm not being anti-God, okay? But let's, we're going on Survivor. Two things I'd bring. One would be a picture of my family. And the second thing would be a really sharp knife. That'd be the two things that I'd bring. But people, you know, it makes you think, what, what's important? Now, okay, the Bible's important to me. It, God's important to me. All right, let's not walk out of here going, oh, he don't believe. You agreed with me. You don't shake your head. You agreed with me that it would be foolish for me to bring the Bible with me. What? I didn't share it, though, with the whole. Oh. <laughs> she didn't share it with audience. I did. She did now. But so anyway, but if you think about it, um, what is most important? Like if, if, if your house was on fire, for example, what would be the one thing that you would grab? What would be the one thing that you would grab? Would you grab your family? Would you grab your autographed football for the 1975 Steelers? not that big. It's not hard to carry. But what would you grab? What would you run in and grab? What's the most important thing? And that's what it is. What is really, what, what is it that you can't live without? This passage today is one that will probably reveal a truth about all of our lives that somewhere along the line, somehow, some way, the longer, especially we're a Christian, we allow things to take first place. God's a jealous God. God gave his best. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, so that we could be saved. He didn't send an angel to be crucified. He sent his, his own son to die on a cross for us. And the reason was because he wanted to give us his best. We, in return, should desire and want to give our best back to the Lord. How many of us have ever failed at that? Wow, some of you are like awesome <laughs> or in a coma. All right, but the thing is, we all fail. The longer you're a Christian, what happens is you become comfortable. Same in a marriage relationship. Cher and I talk about this all the time. We have our struggles at times about things. 35 years being married, there's times that we start to take each other for granted. There really is. Because she's there, I'm there. We're always there. So let's just take it for granted. You always got to work on it. You always got to keep that in the forefront, that this is something that you're going to continue to work on, no matter if you've been married five years, 10 years, 50 years. It doesn't matter. We have a tendency, human nature has a tendency to begin to take things for granted. We can do that with our relationship with Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who literally gave their all. Why? Because they believed in what they were doing was, get this word, worth it. They believed it was worth it. Worth is all about value. What is something worth to you? Now, 
for some, value or worth looks differently to other people. Um, I'm not a big art person. Uh, you know, I, I met a guy one time, he said he was a painter. I said, oh, like houses, garages, like, he goes, no, I'm a painter. I go, oh, in, interior then, you, you, you do interior, commercial? Do you do commercial? He goes, no, I'm a painter. I'm like, I don't know what else you paint. Cars, cars, you're a car painter, right? He goes, no, I'm a painter. I'm like, well, what? He paints, like art stuff. I'm not a big art guy. I, I had to take, which is, see, I didn't say something I was going to say. I, I almost said college is stupid. I didn't say that. Because one of the classes I had to take in college was art appreciation. Why? Why? I started swimming at 5 a.m. I'd be done at 7.15. My first class was at 7.30. And I'd go sit in an auditorium with 500 other people and take art appreciation where the professor would show paintings of basically older, overweight, naked women and talk about the, the Renaissance thing. I don't know what it is. And anyway, we would sit there, and I was okay as long as I had a box of raisins with me. But as soon as those box of raisins were gone, I was gone. I was out. It was an hour and a half class. It was horrible. It was the most horrific thing. Well, no, it was, it was in the top 10 of what I had to endure was art appreciation. And I've got to be honest with you. To this day, I have never needed that class that I had to attend. Never once has somebody come in, so what do you think of the Renaissance period? I don't care. <laughs> but anyway, some people really like art. Value is something worth to everybody different. But the fact of the matter is, what is worth it? What is worth it? If something is worth it, you will give your all. To me, my relationship with Jesus Christ has been worth it. I have given him my all. My family comes second. My wife and then my kids. My wife, my grandson, and then my kids <laughs> fall into... I, would, I have and I will continue to give my all. You know why? Because that's what worth it. This church, this body of believers, this thing called the firehouse is worth it. Your lives are worth it. See, that's to me what's value. So if I, each one of us have to look at what's value. And what we really have to look at, what is the common denominator in what we see as something that is worth it? Our prayer is that Jesus Christ in your relationship with God is worth it. When we see something of value, we make every effort to attain it and then to maintain it. We make every effort. When we see something of value, we go after it. Why? Because it's something precious. It's something, uh, I'm, not a, I, I'm not into, I, I don't care about stuff. I'm not, we don't care about stuff. We're not stuff people. You know, we actually park our cars in our garage. Always have, always will. You know why? Because we don't have a lot of stuff. We just, whatever we have, we use. It's there because for a purpose. I'm not into stuff. Sometimes, oftentimes, what happens is we get filled up with a lot of stuff and we lose the value of what's really important. So think about it. If you only had a few things that you could list as important, what would be your list? What would you say is something that is valuable to you? Christ addresses this issue very honestly uh, and very directly. And that's what we're going to look at today. There, for him, for Christ, there's no beating around the bush for sure. I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 9. The book of Luke chapter 9. And uh, I'm going to begin reading at verse 57. And then I'll give you a little so you don't have to read the whole chapter. But beginning at Luke 9 verse 57 reads as this. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever, and hear that, wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Then Jesus said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go bury my, dad, my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, 
But first, let me go say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, the very first thing you have to understand, a lot of things have transpired right before this conversation happened. What has transpired has been very public stuff. Jesus Christ has been out among the public doing things that people have seen. For example, and I think one of the biggest motivators why there was a following of Jesus Christ in this passage and today is this. Jesus Christ, in the earlier part of this chapter, had just fed 5,000 men. Now, you, that's just men. So it, they don't count the females and they don't count the kids. So it could be 10,000, it could be 15,000, it could be 20,000 people that Jesus Christ and his disciples just fed. They fed people so much that their stomachs were full to the place where there were leftovers. There were leftovers after feeding all that. And I really believe that today that's kind of what we look to God to do. Just feed me. Just stuff me full. And that's all I want. And as long as you keep stuffing me full, I'm okay with you. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but so that had happened. Then there were, there, then there were uh, uh, the healing of a demon-possessed boy right in front of the crowds. This boy was brought to him, and Jesus Christ cast the demon from him, and the, and the boy was set free in front of everybody. And there were great teachings that were done that Jesus Christ had given during this period of time here before this conversation happened. Well, here's three men that are following Jesus Christ because it says that they were right there. They were following him. Three men with three butts. First one, he says, I will follow you wherever you go. I will follow you. Can you imagine, you know, you've you, you just been fed. You, you, you just saw a, a young boy delivered from a demon. You heard great teachings. And you're like, I'll follow you wherever you go. I'll follow you. How many are Cubs fans? Yeah. Um, when we came out here, because we're from Pittsburgh and, and National League teams, that's all I know is National League team. We came out here. Uh, I didn't even know there was a Chicago White Sox. I'm sorry, don't get mad at me. I didn't know. I didn't because you're an American League team. We 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 knew nothing about that. And 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 somebody asked me when I was first out here, are you a Cubs fan or a White Sox fan? I go, I, who who which one's the National League? He said Cubs. I go, then I'm a Cubs fan. Okay. So last night uh, they they got into the World Series, and uh, yeah, which <laughs> the thing though that that really got me. Um, sure, I got to tell you a story about the guy with the pink hat, though, Jeff told me. But anyway, uh, there, <laughs> side note, they, they kept showing a lady, an older lady, on the front row. Did you see her? I, I was, <laughs> don't knock my beer over. Uh, <laughs> she, but I, I told Chira, I she's sitting there, and her, she's got tears, and, and, you know, who knows? She might be a Cubs fan for just a week. I don't know. But I'm kind of guessing she's been holding on for a very, very, very 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 long time she's been holding on and you know she's she's one of those die hard i'm there for in it for forever and i actually said to some guys at the gym on friday i said if the cubs make it in the world series will you guys root for them no i'm like no because i know they're white Sox fan i go wait a minute but but they're a chicago team no they're not i'm like wow this is rough <laughs> I said, well, when the White Sox went to the World Series, I rooted for the White Sox. Well, we won't. We won't root for the Cubs. So, I mean, there's, there's people that are very divided on that. But the fact is, this lady looked, and if, don't, if their story's different, don't, don't ruin, don't rain on my parade. I just look at this lady, and I saw her crying and holding her beer. And she's like, you know, because there's a guy standing on a dugout or something. She's like, don't, you know, like, you kick my beer, I'll break your legs. And, and you know, but anyway, she's, she's, she's sitting there, and you just see tears. And I'm thinking, oh, she's got to be for 100 years. She's got to be a fan, you know. And um, so the fact is, you stick with it. 
Okay? And so here, this one says, this guy says, I'll follow you wherever you go. Now, this sounds legit. It's like, hey, Lord, here am I, send me. At first glance, we see a man who is willing. Like, hey, put me in, coach. I'm yours. I'm your guy. Put me in, coach. I'm there. And we, we take a step back and we go, wow, talk about willingness. Here's this guy that looks at him and says, I will follow you wherever you go. I won't just follow you if you go down this way. I won't follow you if you just go down that way. But wherever you go, wherever you go, I will follow you. What's that old saying something about some path is paved with good intentions? What, is, that, is that the saying? What is? Road to hell is paved with good intentions. There you go. I knew it was something like that. But how true is that? We always have good intentions. But for us to stay in there, we have to see the value of what we're staying in there for. Did this guy really see the value? Jesus saw something different. In fact, the way Jesus replied to him was this. What he's seeing in the man who has been moved, hear this, by events. But the man really hasn't counted the cost. The man really hasn't counted the cost. Because Jesus, in fact, responds to him and says, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. There is a cost, there is a definite cost of following Jesus Christ. There is a cost we need to be aware of, we need to know, but here's my, here's my understanding. I don't care what something costs. If it's a value to me, it's worth it. If it's a value to me, it is worth it. For me to know that Jesus Christ suffered on a cross, to know that he was beaten, he was whipped, he was spat upon, he was ridiculed, he was harassed, he suffered my iniquity and my sin. For me to know that he did that and he would do it all over again for me, for just me, and by the way, all of you, even while I was yet away from him, even when I was willing to curse his name, he was still willing to die for me. Even when he knew the, the outcome would be suffering, he saw the worth in me. He saw the worth in you. So for him, he counted the cost. So I take a step back and I go, if he's willing to do that for me, why can't I or why should I not be willing and to, to serve him? I want that to be my worth. I want that to be my value. I want that to be my, my mark that I go after. Side note, in today's world, this could very easily be someone, get me, who is filled more with church than they are with Christ. I'm grateful that I grew up an, uh, an HK, heathen's kid. Didn't go to church. I mean, my church, uh, uh, my church um, attendance stopped after first grade when it just ended at first grade. So... I didn't have church stuff in me. And when I came to church at 16, give my heart to Christ at 17, but I was 16 when I f first went back to church. And when I heard about Jesus Christ and I sat for months and I listened to about Christ and the cross and the crucifixion and love and the blood and heaven and hell and the promises of hope. And I sat there and I just took it in and listened and listened and listened. I didn't filter it through with a lot of you had to filter through church stuff. I was just there open. And because of that, I came in and I was able to accept a lot of things that other people really struggled with. I just looked at it like, wow, this is amazing. While others sat there when he heard about the cross, I would look across, and we have a good church back in, in Pittsburgh, and I would look across at people's faces when, when Rev was standing up there, you know, you know, just red in face and holding the Bible and talking about the cross and the blood of Jesus and everybody. People are just sitting there like this. Or sitting there like this. Or they're looking through their purse. And I would sit there and I'd go, don't they get it? I'd say to cheer, don't they get it? Don't they realize what's going on here? He's talking about, he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the Lord. He's talking about what he's done. And see what happens is we lose our value. We become like this guy. Hey, I'll follow you anywhere <laughs> until you go somewhere I don't want to go. I'll follow you anywhere until it becomes uncomfortable for me. And then I'm not going to follow you anymore. 
And that's what Jesus saw. He saw a guy whose belly was full, who was impressed by what he did, but he really didn't understand the cost. There's got to be a cost. There is a cost. There's an urgency. Tim and I were just talking this morning. There is an urgency. There is an urgency in today's Christianity for people to know Jesus Christ. There's an urgency. There is an urgency. You leaders of the firehouse, you're going to be hearing more from me. There is a huge urgency. There's a huge urgency of people. I, okay, let me, I'm going to share. Let me, okay, here's, here's, what I, here's how I see it. I just don't want to show up here. I don't want to do church. I don't want to, church makes me want to vomit. I just don't want to do church. I don't want to sit up. I just don't want to sing along with most of the songs unless they go really high and I can't do that. I, 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 or they sing parts. Parts throw me off. Like, I don't know. I'm singing. A, I, I just don't want to do church. I don't want to say hi. Nice to see you. Give you a hug, kiss. You know, and, you know, nice to see you too, even if I don't mean it. But, you know, I, I just don't want to come in and, and say, hey, you know, hey, meatheads, good to have you. You know, I, I don't want to just, I, I just don't want to play church. And then when we're all done, go, oh, what? that was just an awesome, and just leave. What is that? What is that? What is that? That's nothing. You know what I want to do? I want to come in the presence of God. That's what I want, and as the pastor, as, as the desire of our heart, we want yins to step into the power of God. That's what we want. And it can happen if you want it to. It can happen if you want it to. If you look at it and go, Phew, okay, you can go to church anywhere. And church, I'm, I'm not ripping anybody's church. I'm not, church is good, okay? But sometimes church only is that. It's church. Sometimes, and get this, only our Christianity is just a term that we use. It's just Christianity. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm just that. I'm just that. I want to be more than just that. Okay? I want to be more. I want you to be more than just that. I want you to seriously enjoy and, and flourish in your faith. And it's going to cost you. You know what it's going to cost you? It's going to cost you everything. But as a Christian of 42 years, I can honestly, as God is my witness, tell you, it is so worth it. It is awesome. It is not without its pain. It's not without its suffering. But I tell you what, I know whose hand I hold. I know whose hand I hold. I know whose hand I hold. I know what it cost. And I'm telling you, it is far worth it. It is so worth it. So, anyway, point number two. Jesus looks at another who is following him. Jesus looks at somebody. Remember the three butts are going along. Jesus looks at this guy and says, follow me. But he replies, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. I, first time I read that, I was like, whoa. Man, he don't he, he he doesn't like people. I mean, that's just harsh. I mean, granted, I grew up in a very, very, very dysfunctional family. We put fun in dysfunctional. There's no doubt about it. But we weren't even that harsh. Like, pff, let the dead bury their dead. I mean, that's just rough. And I and I went to Rev and I said, Yo, Rev, I said. Why does Jesus not like people? He goes, ah, Trulio, you're an idiot. Okay, can we get beyond that? Can you explain to me why Jesus doesn't like people? And the whole bottom line is he does like people. In fact, he loves people. And that's not what he was saying. Here's the thing. The guy's dad wasn't dead. He said, well, let me first go bury my father. Well, first of all, if his dad was dead and not buried yet, that guy's butt wouldn't be with Jesus. See, because Jewish tradition is, you die, you get buried, the family's right there to mourn. So Jesus standing there, <laughs> wait a minute, dude, seriously. You want to use the excuse, well, first let me go bury my father? Well, then why are you here? See, his father hadn't died yet. So what the guy was saying is, let me go home, and let me just continue on with my life, and when my dad dies, and after we bury him, then I'll come and follow you. See? What he'd done is Jesus saw that the man wasn't going to follow him immediately. 
what he was calling this man to do is come follow me now. The time is now. The time is now to follow Jesus. Not tomorrow, not next week. The time is now to follow Jesus. Now I know some, you come here, you listen, and I've been there. You listen, you take it in, and you process it, and you process it, and process it. But let me tell you something. I dated this girl on and off for seven years. Seven years. And finally, when I knew she was about to kill herself, I looked at her on the couch in between the commercials and said, yo, you want to get married? I knew it was time. I pulled the trigger. And she says, you're doing it right now? Yeah, hurry up, the commercial's almost over. We didn't have VCRs, DVDs, and all that stuff. So you miss, you, the commercial ends, it goes right into the show. We can't miss the show. Actually, my dad was sitting on the other side of her. He couldn't hear, though. He was, I think he was asleep. But I said, yo, you want to get married? And she's like, after she got over the initial shock, and she said, well, yes. I said, okay, good. Well, then we'll get married. And then the show came back on. And the discussion, I mean, pff, move on. <laughs> okay, question asked, question answered, move on. Okay, that's how it works. But the fact is that time is now. The time is now. I knew, I knew when I accepted Jesus Christ, the time was now. I knew. I, I, I wanted to embrace him. I, wa I, wanted to, I wanted to know him. I wanted to understand him. I wanted, I wanted him to have my heart. The time is now. The time is now. See, this guy felt, you know what? This is good. I'll be back after my dad dies. Now his dad might live another 30 years. So the question that begs to all of us, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? If something is of value and it's right in front of you, if you don't reach out and take it now, will it still be there? And then finally, the third guy, the third but. And still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Again, here's where <laughs> Jesus replies, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Again, does he not like family? Because this guy was saying a legit thing. He says, first, let me go say goodbye to my family. Let me, let me you know, say, okay, I'm leaving, and I just want to say goodbye to you. Well, again, it's not that Jesus is anti-family, but Jesus wants your attention. Jesus wants, get this, your all. Jesus wants your all. When Cher and I talk to young couples that are getting married, we talk to them about priorities of marriage. We talk to them about, listen, you got to hold priorities in line. You got to keep them solid because if not, things are going to creep in and they're going to cause dysfunction in your marriage. We talk about that. We talk about the first important thing that you need to keep as a priority in your marriage is Jesus Christ. You need to keep him as the center post of your life because then everything that you do hangs off of the center post of Christ. Then it will be stable. It will be solid. You will do it. Keep that as a first. Then the second priority is make it of you each other. And then as kids come, they come behind each other. That's a priority of life. That's how it should work. Your job should be then after that. That's a priority. That's how it should work. That's what it's important. And the fact is that it, you, you got to realize that the importance of having Christ at the center, that's what's important. When Jesus looked at him, and, or when the other one said, I will follow you, but first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. If you're going to follow me, do it now. Make me a priority of your life. Make me first in your life. That's where Christ wants to be. He not only wants to be our Savior, but he wants to be our Lord. He wants to be first in our lives. First. Is he first? Seriously, think about it today. Is he first? But then when you think about it, if he's first, what's first now? Where's that going to go? Things cost us. See what I'm saying? Things cost us. The cost of following Jesus is it'll cost us everything. But nothing, absolutely nothing, will come close to it because you discover the value of knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For me, that's what's so amazing. For me, that's what makes me tick. For me, that's what drives me every single day in my life is to know how much Jesus Christ loves me. And that my life is of value to him. My life means something to him. 
as well as your life, mean something to him. He's showing this man priorities of life. Priorities of life. Parents, teach your kids. Train your kids up in the way they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. Parents, model to your kids Jesus Christ. Show them Jesus Christ. Teach them Jesus Christ. Walk in Jesus Christ. I dealt with it as being a youth pastor. I deal with it being a pastor. If for parents, church isn't a priority, if God's not a priority, it will not be a priority to your kids. And when your kids are 16 and they really need to come to church because they're so jacked up, and you're going to say to them, let's go to church, they're going to look at you and tell you, go somewhere. And it won't be to church. Because I've had parents come to me and go, oh, I don't know what went wrong. I don't know. They used to love Sunday school. Well, when was the last time they were in Sunday school? When they were six? Now all of a sudden they need Jesus because they're jacked up because the world has flooded in. You know why? Because their priorities were not straight. And by the way, parents, don't try to be your kid's friend. Don't hope that your kids like you. They're not going to like you. They're not going to like you. I look at my kids. I, I know you don't like me. I don't like me either. The voices don't even like me. I don't care if you don't like me. This is the way you're looking. We're, we're not your friends. We're not your buddies. But this is what we're going to do. Get on board or pack it up. There's the door. Have at it. But then we realize they're six. So, uh, you know, <laughs> okay, you can come back in. <laughs> Just straighten up, would you? Listen, priorities. The lesson of this one is if you're going to start, if you're going to start to follow, do it. They're, uh, you see they're mowing down the fields right now. These new tractors are awesome. They're phenomenal. They got everything in I mean... They got, they're equipped, like the, the one that was sitting in uh, Zach's front yard uh, for the wedding. They got GPS, they got air conditioning, they got heat, they got, uh, uh, they got everything. They got sound systems, they got, you, and you punch in, and it just GPSs you all through the field. It is amazing. It is just so cool. I want one. I just, I don't know, maybe I can mow my lawn with it. I don't know. <laughs> One swoop and the pool's down. Uh, but anyway, so, but the thing is, they're, 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 they're out in the field and they're plowing, you know, they're, they're mowing everything down. And man, everything is just perfect, 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 perfect. Well, what he's referring to is any man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worth it. Let's go back a few years when they didn't have GPS. Let's go back a few years when they plowed with a horse pulling the plow. The fact is, you had to watch where that plow was going because here's the thing, you made that plow by hand. You hit a rock in the ground, you break your plow. You break your plow, your planting season is over. Your planting season is over, you have no food to harvest come harvest time. You have no food to harvest at harvest time, you then starve to death. Or you pay money that you really don't have on food so you can feed your family. So see, they had to keep their eyes forward. Once you put your hand to the plow and you tell the horse to go, you got to keep your hand there. If you're looking backwards, you're not going to go straight or you're going to hit something and you're going to damage your plow. Well, that's what he said when he looked at him and said, listen, once you put your hands to the plow, those who look back are not worthy. Jesus Christ says, once you take a hold of him, do not look back to your old life. Your old life will only pull you away. Don't look back to your old mistakes. Don't look back to your old things. Look to Christ. Keep the cross. As Paul says, you keep the cross of Jesus Christ right there. That's what you go for. That's what you go after. That's where your hope is. That's where your value is. That's where it's at. You will save, you will save so much heartache if we only do that. We will save so much pain if we only do that. We just... Stay there. Put your hands to the plow. That's where you go. You don't look back. That's what he said to this guy. Three buts, three reasons that Jesus Christ uh, 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 said to them. The bottom line is, what's it of value to you? What's it of value? Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for every life and heart that is here today.
that our value and our hope would be found in you. And Lord, I know you have stirred things in people's lives. I know you've stirred things in my own life. Now I just pray, God, for those who are empty, those who are lost, those who are without you. God, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're full of a religion or maybe they're full of tradition or maybe they're just full of the world. But God, they need your hope. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that people would surrender their lives to you today and that hope would be found in Christ and in him alone. With your heads bowed for just a moment, and every week we do this, and I would like to do it again once again today. We give people the opportunity to pray and to accept Christ in their life as their Lord and Savior. And how we do it, if you don't know by now, is I will lead you in a prayer. And once you pray, I will lead you in prayer. You pray, you're accepting Christ into your life. And in a moment, I'll look across this room. And if you want to pray with me, I'm going to ask you to look at me. And once I make eye contact with you, you can close your eyes. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you start, start new. What you're doing is you're putting your hand to the plow. Starting on my left, you want to pray that with me? Look at me right now. All you got to see is your eyes. Sure. Any more? Cool. Got them. My right. Okay. Any others? Sure. Got them. Cool. All right. Pray this from your heart. Lord Jesus, I surrender all of who I am. It's no longer me, but it's going to be you in me. I ask, Lord Jesus, for your forgiveness. I ask, Lord Jesus, for you to come into my life. I accept you and I receive you as my Lord. Thank you for coming in. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those who prayed that this morning. And God, I pray that you would encourage and you would strengthen. But Lord, I pray for the remainder of this body that's here today. That God, that we would see the urgency. That God, that most importantly, would see the value of who you are and who we can be in you. God, strip away things from our lives. And may we just know that your love is sufficient. I believe, God, in great things for each and every person that's here today. Great things knowing, God, that you hold their hand. I pray, Lord, you encourage the weak and the struggling and you watch over and protect. Why don't you all stand this morning? If you would like.